Okay, we are live on Facebook and fully broadcast. So welcome back. This is episode three of I Dry Needle to the Point. Uh, it's a live video podcast. Week three, we've already had some awesome episodes. We started with Shannon Long on our I Dry Needle team. Last week, we were in the saddle talking dry needling and cycling with Aaron Castanagwe. And this week, we are very happy to have Dr. Nick Nowicki. And honestly, I've known him for a few years. We could talk about several topics, even when it comes to dry needling, different patient populations. But trying to keep this conversation to 15 minutes or less once we get to it. Today, we're going to focus on uh, the care that he provides for some of the PGA Tour events, so using dry needling and golfing. Uh, if you uh, have not joined us in the past, I'm Paul Kaloran. I'm a physical therapist. I'm founder, current president of I Dry Needle. I'm a dry needling educator, uh, and I'll be your host. I'll introduce our guest. I mentioned his name, Dr. Nick Nowicki. He's from the Chicagoland area, owns Nowicki Chiropractic. He is a certified chiropractic sports physician, also certified strength and conditioning specialist. He is uh, an ART, active release technique provider, as well as Graston. And he's also a level two TPI, so Titleist Performance Institute, medical and fitness professional. So Nick, thanks for joining. I'll let you introduce yourself as well. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. I think you pretty much covered everything uh, that, that we need to know, and especially we could talk all day about my credentials, but we only have 15 minutes. So, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That, I think I pigeonholed myself too much because as soon as we get started, I'm going to hit the little timer and we have 15 minutes to get through all the stuff. Um, I did wear my golf polo today. Um, as did I. I'm wearing I my John Deere Classic shirt here. This was actually the first event that I worked uh, a few years back. That's awesome. Then, yeah, we're ready to dive right in. So timer starting. Uh, I'll kick it off. So Nick, how long have you been providing chiropractic care um, on the PGA Tour? Well, uh, I've been part of a network called Professional Sports Care for uh, nearly five years. Um, and I've been providing care at tour events uh, for approximately just over three years. Uh, my first event was in 2018 at the John Deere Classic. Uh, and I worked a couple of events. Uh, actually, I worked three events in 2019, uh, including filling in at the last minute at the BMW Championship at Medina. And uh, this past year with uh, COVID and everything, I was slated to work a couple of events, but one of the events got canceled. And then I did drop out of another event because it uh, coincided with my wife's due date of our second child. So couldn't miss that. Uh, but uh, fortunately, I was able to work an event about two weeks ago out in the Dominican Republic. Uh, and some of the most gorgeous scenery I've seen uh, at a golf course yet. So, I actually saw some of your photos, and I agree. That must have been a nice little uh, time away, I guess, a little respite to uh, the exotic Punta Cana. It's definitely a nice change of scenery compared to my uh, twenty, you know, six hundred twenty-five square foot uh, square <laughs> piece of heaven here at the office here. <laughs> Speaking of your six hundred twenty-five square foot. Um, I recently, I actually posted it on our social media, but I see that there's essentially this PGA treatment trailer that kind of tours with the athletes from site to site. So I assume that you have experience with that. And really, like, what does a typical day for you uh, look like in the tour trailer? Right. Um, the pictures that you've seen of the trailers uh, that were released uh, not too long ago, uh, these are new trailers, actually, uh, that uh, were just rolled out at the end of last year. Uh, prior to that, there were trailers, but uh, they weren't as swanky looking as the new ones. Uh, and uh, there is where I do my work when I'm uh, at events, except for when I was in Dominican Republic, I had to work at a villa. They couldn't obviously bring that over to the Dominican Republic. Uh, but sense. typically, um, my days are very long when on the tour. Uh, I start uh, dark and early usually somewhere between 5 and 5.30 a.m. And uh, typically I don't get done till about 7 p.m. Uh, so uh, they are long days. Um, there are some downtime throughout the day, uh, but uh, they can be sometimes rather long, like I said. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. I guess that makes sense, even just like the tea times, like the day yes. one and two for the tour. Yes. yes. 
Um, and yeah, you provide chiropractic care. Like I know you personally, I forget how many years ago, um, we were on a dry needling course together, but you're uh, now. December 2016, uh, that was the one. 16 in Wisconsin. Yep. yep. And at this point, I mean, you're an expert dry needler. Um, I assume. I wouldn't say that. I'm always learning. <laughs> well, I'd say if you want to see some advanced dry needling techniques, among other things, um, I'll mention it again at the end, but you should follow Nick on social media, Instagram, Facebook, at Dr. Nick Nowicki or at Nowicki Chiropractic because daily it seems he just little video snapshots of what he's doing in the clinic. And I, yeah, they are advanced dry needling techniques. So. Oh, thank you for the compliment. <laughs> Learn from the best. Well, thank you for that. Um, so I assume chiropractic care, you're working alongside other providers, PTs, ATCs. How does yes. that um, multidisciplinary care work when you're on an event? Yeah, so um, as a chiropractor, you know, I'm uh, there in the trailer, and I'm usually typically working with one to two physical therapists. Now, the, the physical therapists that are on staff, they have two full-time physical therapists okay. that usually travel for about, I don't know, anywhere from about 18 to 20 events a year. Uh, and they have a couple of part-time guys that uh, don't do as many as those guys do. Us chiropractors, we tend to cycle in and out from event to event. Some of us work a few more events than others, uh, but for the most part, uh, we're usually assigned regionally. Um, so um, with the physical therapist, you know, we work together um, and handle the flow throughout the day. Some days can be very, very busy, and some days can tend to be slower, uh, typically. Um, also, uh, there are a couple athletic trainers that typically work at the events as well. They are usually at the workout trailer, uh, putting uh, their uh, the golfers through certain uh, what is it, routines that they need to do to get themselves warmed up throughout the day. Excellent. So really, there's like a fitness workout trailer and more of a, a medical management trailer? That is correct. Yeah. And both of those trailers uh, are brand spanking new. Uh, and uh, like I said, it's, uh, they're really, really, they're very nice to work in, I got to say. Yeah. I mean, I think the article I saw was on ESPN. And yeah, they looked top of the line. Right. Yeah. We, we have a lot of different things to help with the athletes get through their week. Uh, you know, all the, the bells and whistles, such as the Norma Tech, the Hypervices, uh, and STEM machines and things of that nature. Awesome. So you've mentioned kind of early dark to after dark, and yes. some days are busy, some days are not. Are most of these athletes coming in before their round, after their round? Uh, the answer is yes, actually. Uh, typically, what you'll see uh, usually on uh, tournament days is a lot of people coming in before the round saying, hey, you know what, can you help me out? I just need a little stretch going on to get myself nice and loose and limber. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally what you will see, you will see the people that have been feeling a little glitchy during their practice, over at the practice range or going through their drills and they need to get uh, quickly limbered up before their, uh, their round. Uh, afterwards, uh, typically, you know, what we got going on is we see the guys that come in that still may be feeling a little glitchy. Some of these guys have probably been uh, beat up, you know, prior to coming to this event and yeah. they need the help before and after rounds. So, um, you know, there, it's very common for me to see a guy a couple times a day before and after working on the same different things or the same things or maybe slightly different things that popped up. Yeah, I believe it. I actually know a handful of uh, guys on the tour and yeah, watching on TV, it seems like such a glamorous, luxurious job. You just get to play golf all day, but it is physically a grind. Like when you think about the travel, the pre and post round conditioning and everything you just mentioned. It is. Um, you know, I, I always think back to a quote that I found uh, in Paul Check's book uh, in, in revolve, involving golf conditioning that the average golf swing, you recruit 95% of your peak muscle activity. That's equivalent to picking up a weight four times and fatiguing out. And that's in one golf swing. Imagine how many swings these guys take a day. Seriously. And all that stress adds up and can break you down. That's fascinating. I'm going to use that. Um, so let's get a little tactical. And really, you don't have to confine your thoughts to the trailer anymore. So whether... You're working with a golfer on site or in the clinic. Let's say first specifically dry needling. What does a typical dry needling treatment look like with some of your golfers? 
Uh, typical dry needling uh, treatments, uh, I use a lot of stim. That's one of the, the big things that I like to implement. Um, and prior to using stim, uh, you know, I just try to find, you know, that sweet spot, that trigger point that may be causing the malfunction in the area and applying the needle through the area and getting a few, uh, trying to piston a few times to get a few twitches out of the area. After I usually get a twitch, I'm usually good. I'm like, let's put on the stim for about 10 minutes and allow that to relax. Um, the, many, the, the number of needles that I use, well, that depends really on the area and the degree of inflammation and pathology through the area. Um, obviously, if I'm working something like in the middle back, I'm probably going to be using uh, significantly more needles than a region such as an elbow or a wrist. So, um, but uh, I can tell you it was, it, uh, you know, it's just like I said, it depends on the area. Uh, when I'm on the tour, I've only needled a handful of, uh, of golfers, um, but I can tell you that uh, preferably if they were to come to see me and request needling, I would like to have them do it on a Tuesday or Wednesday uh, before they act an actual tournament day to see how things are. Because as you know, sometimes with needling, there can be a little bit of soreness that can occur afterwards. And that's just very, very critical when you're uh, working on the tour or with any golfer to give full disclosure and say, hey, look, these are some of the risks that may be associated with this. And especially on the tour because, hey, you know what, if, if a, you know, a golfer has an adverse reaction to what you do, well, that could hurt him uh, on the standings in that particular week. So very, very important to, you know, once again, cover all the risks that associated with treatment. And... Um, on the, the tour, like I said, I prefer to work on people with needling if it's a Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, this particular past event that I worked, I had a gentleman come in on Thursday morning, uh, about an hour and a half before a round. He came in, he was all smiles. It's like, hey, who's doing needling this week? And uh, I raised my hand and I'm like, what time are you going off, man? It's like, I go off in about an hour. I was hoping if you can take a look at this particular area for me. And, you know, we sat him down. And I'm like, okay, what we're going to do, we're not going to be doing something very aggressive, obviously, because you're about to go off and play your round. So uh, I worked on him, and, uh, and I said, you know, go in peace. Have a good day. Good luck. And uh, he came in the next uh, day, and he's like, hey, man, guess what? You did a great job. Feel great. I was wondering if you could needle this other area. And I'm like, okay, sure. Let, you know, better luck even good. Uh, let's take a look at this other area here. And uh, he was fortunate to have another good day uh, after that. So um, on a day where, you know, it's a tournament day, like I said, I'm tending to not to go too aggressive with the pistoning as well as I'm not doing the stim as very intense as well, trying to do it at a lower level and not doing it super, super long. And then afterwards, typically what I'll do is some sort of uh, manual therapy technique just to loosen up the area afterwards. Yeah, I think you, first of all, you hit on a, a common question we get on courses, not even just level one, but all uh, level two, like even clinical integration is like, if we're treating athletes, how soon before and how quickly after? And I think you just painted this picture of, it depends, like people it handle it very differently. It also depends, like you uh, summarized, like in your dosage, number of needles, amount of pistoning, even the use of STEM. So it's tough because sometimes people want that black and white, like you would never do it 24 hours before or two hours after, but that's not the case. There are athletes that actually uh, very successfully use it immediately before and immediately after. Yes, and uh, you know, prior to working with that particular golfer at the last event that I was at, I, you know, I made sure to ask him, like, okay, what's your needling experience in the past? Have you had it yeah. done? Had he not ever had the technique done, I probably would have, and especially because it was a day of a tournament, I probably would have talked him out of it just because I'm kind of the adage, you don't try something new uh, before a major event. That's just something that I've learned personally with uh, my patients over the years and also personally with me uh, uh, in my experience with doing uh, triathlons and uh, ultra marathons. You don't want to try to do anything majorly new or drastic before major events. Yeah, I think that's wise, especially with the needle, slightly yes. more invasive and yeah, kind of a unique response. Um, you kind of uh, answered or kind of segued to the next question. You said you follow up with some joint-based care. You mm -hmm. do, I mean, not even just active release, Graston, 
you're a chiropractic physician, which means I'm sure you do mobilization manipulation. You yes. in your clinic, you have cryo chamber, you have body tempering. Yes. So how does dry needling fit into the algorithm of everything else you do? Well, dry needling, uh, it is definitely uh, an important uh, modality that I use on an everyday basis. Uh, next to probably active release technique, it's my most utilized uh, modality that I use and okay. it caused the most profound change. It's just, uh, that's what uh, floored me when I first started using needling and implementing needling in my practice was just the profound changes that I got immediately after working with some of my athletes. Uh, so um, typically, uh, it, I, I typically like to needle people, not on an every visit basis. I like to give their body a little bit of time to recover uh, after um, uh, subsequent treatments where, you know, especially if it's a real hot area, I may needle it once and then maybe wait a visit and then needle again after that, just so we have enough time for that tissue to heal up. Uh, but it's uh, it's definitely one of my go-to techniques that I use on an everyday basis here. Yeah, and again, I gather that from your social media, but I have almost the exact same uh, sentiment because I also was very Maitland-based joint mobilization prior to needling. I thought I could mob and manip anyone back to health. And once I added needling, kind of just, first of all, just added this neuromyofascial layer on my joint-based mind, but everything you just said about being one of the most profound modalities in the clinic. Uh, that definitely was my same experience as well. So uh, we have less than a minute left. So if I was just to ask, I know this is a challenging, very large, ambiguous question, but for our listeners working with golfers, and let's not even say pro golfers, these are the, the recreational athletes. I recently heard that golfing was one of the um, top, like, uh, the increased interest in golfing during COVID was one of the main hobbies to spike. So if you had one clinical pearl for our listeners who are going to see perhaps this rush of recreational golfers, what sort of advice would you give? Uh, what I would tell you is, you know, make sure you do a, a thorough head to toe mobility screen uh, with your patients uh, because in the game of golf, when a patient or you know, slash golfer presents with a certain symptom, not everything you know, presents as it seems to be. Uh, there's more you know, that meets the eye because although they may be experiencing perhaps, let's say, low back pain, that problem could be stemming from someplace else in the kinematic chain, such as the hips or the middle part of the back. Uh, and like I said, a, a very thorough uh, mobility screen is essential with working with golfers because everything is working from head to toe to produce that motion. And, you know, especially with avid golfers, uh, with a lot of people during these times sitting behind a computer screen, working day in and day out, you develop those mobility issues throughout the body that can load certain areas excessively. Yep. I love that. And honestly, I'm going to have you repeat your point about 95%, partially so I can write it down, but everything you just said, I think it puts into context when you think of the, the work rate and the torque going through the body. So that'll be our final conclusion point, mainly so I can write it down, but. Yeah, but like I said, you know, a little bit earlier, 95% and comes from 90% of the peak muscle activity is recruited during the golf swing, uh, which is equivalent to picking up a weight four times and fatiguing out. Uh, that uh, quote is from Paul Check's book um, that he wrote many, many years ago. Uh, there are a lot of great exercises and information in that book. Uh, and it was written, I think, probably about 20 some years ago. And there's a lot of stuff. And as you know, Paul, you know, things are always changing in totally. the world of, of uh, athletics and rehab and stuff like that. There's a lot of great information that is implemented to this day in that book. It is truly you know, a must read if you are interested with working with golfers. Um, and if you are a clinician or a fitness professional, I highly recommend you take a look at the, the Titles Performance Institute's uh, seminar series as well. It's another fantastic program to get you uh, to understand the game of golf. And you don't have to play golf to work with golfers as well, Paul. I, I wanted to you know, let the people know about that. I don't play a lick of golf, but you know the knowledge that I've gained 
from uh, the various uh, seminars that I've attended have allowed me to work at this level that I'm at right now at the, you know, the top of the, uh, of, you know, the top stage the front and center working on the best golfers in the world. Uh, I second that. Uh, I actually have a few TPI trained PTs that I refer to. I mean, I know enough uh, about the demands of golf to be dangerous, but if it, it seems not to be responding to my uh, approach, then yeah, I will second that whether you're, on the fitness performance conditioning side or the medical side that the, the TPI, the Institute is top notch. If you're seeing golfers as any part of your population. Um, we are past time. That's crazy. Every time I set this timer, I'm like, this was really a bad idea for a podcast, like to keep it that succinct, but you did great. Thank you thank for, you, um, first of all, thank you for joining. And I hope you can be back. We can talk, uh, endurance athletes, triathletes, I do think we could talk how to more tactically use STEM. I, again, based on your social media, I think you use it very creatively. And uh, even the way you explain it is there's value in that twitch response and pissing, but there's also some versatility to how we can apply STEM. Right. So uh, I'll mention again, at Nick Nowicki or at Nowicki Chiropractic on Instagram and Facebook. Is that correct? Uh, at Dr. Nick Nowicki, yes. At and that's uh, No Wiki Chiropractic uh, on Instagram. Yeah. There we go. Excellent. Yep. Um, and we have some great episodes coming up. Next Wednesday, we have Andrew Ball, who is a, uh, he's an instructor in real-time ultrasound. He's a myopane dry needling faculty, and we will talk dry needling safety. Wednesday after that, we have big uh, billboard headlining name, Sue Falcone. And honestly, I don't know how I'm going to keep that to 15 minutes, but we're very excited for Sue to be on. And then after that, we have Jeff Moore, which maybe dry needling won't be the specific topic, but he is, you know, innovator, pioneer, 30,000 foot view, big picture of what's happening, not just in PT, but in healthcare. So Nick, thanks again for your time. I hope to thank see you, you again Paul. soon. I hope to see you soon. And, uh, you know, thank you once again. And it's always a pleasure talking with you. Yeah. Thanks for your time, Nick. Take care. See you guys.